Welcome to the Empowered to Connect podcast, where we come together to discuss a healing-centered approach to engagement and well-being for ourselves, our families, and our communities. I'm J.D. Wilson, and I am your host. And today on the show, we go back to one of our most foundational principles, and that is seeing the need behind the behavior and what we call chasing the why. Um, All the time, we see confusing behavior with our kids all the time. It elicits a response in us that may or may not be healthy. Uh, Spoiler alert, a lot of times it is not a healthy first response that it brings up with us. But then we have to figure out what is actually happening here. None of us are wanting to parent our kids from a place of ignorance. None of us are wanting to uh, rule our homes with an iron fist and just steamroll our kids on our way to good behavior. We all want our kids to actually thrive and actually be happy and actually do well in the world. And in order to do so, oftentimes what we have to remember is that our kids are communicating by their behaviors, not always with their words. So today on the show, we unpack this whole principle and talk at length with Mo and Tana about how to chase the why. Hope you enjoy it. Here they are. Before we get to that interview, our episode today is brought to you by Ryan and Rose. The good folks at Ryan and Rose have been creating family products for everything from pacifiers, pacifier clips, universal bottle holders, bags, totes, all that kind of stuff, uh, and are longtime huge supporters of the program here at ETC. And so uh, they have done something incredible for our listeners. For those of you who go and buy something at ryanrose.co, so ryanandrose.co, you are going to get 20% off your order by using the code ETC20. Uh, a lot of times I know for, for those of us who are buying uh, gifts or just trying to be thoughtful about where our money goes in the community, it is important for us to understand um, how to support folks that are also um, just making a difference in their world. So I would just tell you from everything that uh, we, can, we can tell you that Ryan and Rose and their entire company, uh, Lindsay and Brett, their entire company are making a massive difference in the world, uh, in the way they uh, run their company, the way that they do their products, everything. And so uh, we cannot say enough about them. They're an incredible, incredible partner to have. And their products are just high quality. They last. They're incredible, beautiful to look at as well. So if you need a baby gift, you need something for your family, you need something to uh, hold a water bottle on the many different vehicles you push these days or uh, transport your kids around in, ryanandrose.co is the place to go. Use code ETC20 at checkout to get 20% off your entire order. That's ETC20 at checkout at ryanandrose.co. Why don't you set this up for us? I think all, all of us as parents have been in a moment of uh, extreme frustration with beha- with behavior and, and not understanding um, where said behavior is coming from. Uh, and one of the things we're going to talk about today is is kind of seeing the need behind the behavior. Will you explain sort of the foundation of this idea? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think you just kind of hinted at it, JD. I mean, I feel like if if you've been parenting, you know, even... Uh, 15, 20 minutes, I think that children's behavior can be um, perplexing and confusing. And I think as parents and caregivers, you know, obviously we want our kiddos to behave in certain ways. I mean, we, we have behavioral expectations. I mean, we have expectations about everything, but we have behavioral expectations. Like my kid will never do blank or my kid shouldn't do blank or this blank behavior is acceptable or this one isn't. I mean, that is just part of being a parent is having expectations around behavior. And uh, I mean, I can't say this for everybody, but Mo and I came into parenting and we thought that behavior was, had a really like nice formula that if we, if we behaved in a certain way and if we said things in a certain way, that that would have this, you know, one-to-one correlation on our kids' behavior. And so when that didn't work out that way, and I don't think it usually does for most people, I think as parents, we can walk away from lots of interactions with our kids feeling confused and perplexed, maybe even wounded and discouraged. Um, Sure. You know, feeling somewhat hopeless. I I think it can begin to... um, 
really deeply impact our own emotional well-being, especially yeah. if you've got kiddos who have some behaviors that that the outside world would see as just fundamentally unacceptable. Yeah. And inside your home, you aren't able to sort of control that behavior in a way that makes you feel like everybody else would give you high five, you're doing awesome as a parent. Um, yeah. I mean, this plays out in so many ways, right? Like if if somebody raises an, a, a child through adulthood and the that child is performing in a way that the world says is successful. What what what's the natural next step? Good job. Parent, mom, mom and dad. Good mom. job, mom and dad. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So the inverse is true. Yeah. We or we at least internalize it. Where it's were their how, parents? What's that? Where were their parents? Yeah. 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 If right. their parents would just A, B, C, or D, mm-hmm. get that behavior under control. I mean, you know, so we get mixed up in the middle of their behavior. It just yeah. is natural parents. When your kid is behaving in a certain way, we get enmeshed, we get confused, it makes us feel certain ways, it makes us, we can go down into a deep, dark spiral of despair. Yeah. Um, it does oftentimes impact like the practicality of the day. Oh, I yeah. just wanted to take, you know, Johnny, we don't have any children named Johnny. <laughs> I just wanted to take Johnny to the zoo. Yeah. And instead, Johnny is, you know, having a problem deciding if he wants scrambled eggs or bacon. And right. now I can't get Johnny to the zoo. I mean, or we're going to be late. I mean, any number of things. So our kids' behavior, just part of being a parent, I think, we can level set this, is being confused by behavior. Yeah. Yeah. If we're honest, right? We're yeah. all, we all hit behavior yeah. sometimes and we're just completely perplexed by yeah. it. Yeah. This was completely the reason that we came to ETC in the beginning. It was because, I mean, not to be overdramatic, but the hopelessness was exactly where I was because I, I was um, I was brought up to to you know to feel on a pretty daily basis, um, and and I don't think in a toxic way necessarily um, that you know my behavior was a reflection of my of my family of my parents, and uh, and so therefore you know what what I'm inherently growing up with as a parent now is when this behavior happens in public, all of a sudden, like, I just look around and above everyone's head, I see just judgment, 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 judgment. And, you know, I, I felt like I was failing as a parent because I couldn't control my kids. That, that's the way that I was thinking about it. Like, this behavior, um, I don't have answers for it. I don't know what to do with it. And honestly, I, I came to ETC because I was like, well, I mean, sure, I'll, I'll listen to anybody right now because any, what I'm not, what I'm doing is not working, you know? And, uh, I, there was a, a breakthrough for me on this particular conversation. Um, and so I, I think the, and even we've all, if around the country, I think there's a, uh, fall break is happening in most schools. And so, uh, and so I know that our families have both been back um, from fall break now and um, on fall break even has some great examples of this where uh, knowing this and kind of having this in my back pocket to use um, helped avoid some massive um, conflict because we were able just to see really quickly like, oh, there's something going on here and let's, let's, let's meet that need and then address the behavior later. But um, so I, I think for, for those who are hearing this and like, Thinking, oh my gosh, I can breathe. Yes, I need to hear more about this. Um, why don't Why don't we talk through some of the some of the practicalities, some of the steps behind um, doing this <laughs> in, in practical parenting? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the very first thing is to reframe the idea, and we we just hinted at it that we can like what is behavior, and can we control our <laughs> I mean, frankly, now I've learned to ask, can I even control my own behavior? So <laughs> that is probably an episode for a different day. Yeah, but yeah. what we what we fundamentally believe is that behavior is communication. And then the next question is, what, a, what is the behavior trying to tell us? And then maybe even underneath that is this belief that we came into parenting with, which is that we can... One, we can control their behavior. And two, they can control their behavior. And so, yeah. you know, it's it's sort of learning and understanding, can, do we fundamentally believe that children can control all of their behavior? Um, and then if behavior is communication, what is it trying to communicate? Mm-hmm. 
the idea of it being communication gives us this freedom to, J.D., as you said, chase the why um, or the what or the wonder behind what's going on here. Um, I wonder why in this moment, you know, this child is behaving in this way. We call it practicing the pause and it is a learned skill and one that I would say Mo and I, I mean, we're both shaking our heads at each other. Also <laughs> a skill that we fail at quite often. Would you agree with that? We do, yes. Yeah. I mean, so what do we mean by practice the pause? Yeah, it's the, it's the beauty of, of stopping, slowing yeah. down, and again, asking the question, why? Why mm-hmm. is that child doing that? And... Um, are, are they, are they, um, you know, they're showing signs of being angry or frustrated. You know, I can, I can take that <laughs> personally, or I can ask the question, well, why, why are they angry? Well, maybe they're fearful. Maybe there's anxiety. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's, I mean, we just, JD just said fall break was just happening. And man, we, we took a trip to the mountains and man, I had all kind of expectations, right? Like we've just been in this <laughs> virtual pandemic world in our house and man, we're going to the mountains. It's the fall, seven hour drive, leaves are changing, mountain streams. And one of our kids like went there like last summer and has asked like, like frequently, can we go back? Can we go back? Like that's his favorite. So, you know, my expectation when we got there that morning, um, you know, we wake up day two and like he and I are up early and we went down to the stream. And I, we're, I'm like, we're about to have this fun moment because this kid <laughs> last summer played hours in the stream. And oh, yeah. all of a sudden, like within seconds, he didn't want to be in the stream. He wanted to go back inside. He wanted to get on his tablet. He didn't like, he was just, he was frustrated on and on. And like, I'll just say for me, like there was this expectation of this beautiful, fun moment. And I could have said, man, he's not flexible. He's being really bratty. Why are you doing that? We're not, no, like there was so much, but I, 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 you know, um, I then began to say, why, why is this kid asking this? Well, when he came in the summer, the mountain stream was warm. Yeah. You know, it was warmer. Now he's there and it's 42 degrees and it's cold. <laughs> and this this said kid does not like cold, right? And it yeah. just changed. But I could stop and say he's disappointed. He's not bratty. Yeah. It's but not, you, you, not you asked a few questions. That's you right. said, hey, bud, I can tell you're, you, you slowed down and you're like, I can tell you're mm-hmm. having a hard time. And I wonder... If you're upset about something, we, we sat down on a rock, a and, big old rock. And the tears and we... came and the emotion came mm-hmm. and it took a little while and we got stuck and then we got through. And then there was the water's cold. Yeah. So it wasn't that Mo was able to quickly go, mm-hmm. oh, the water's cold. That must be what's wrong. But because we have practiced this way of parenting, mm-hmm. I do think that our kids have enough like motor memory, if you will for curious conversations Mm -hmm. where we're trying to unpack what's going on even behind the emotion. Well, we didn't even know what the emotion was, honestly. What's going on behind the way you're acting? Right. But not in a way that induces shame, but in a way that, that, is full of empathy and care and right. curiosity. Right. Like I can, uh, yeah. for me to pause, I, I mean, I can relate to being disappointed. Like that, oh, there yeah. we are. I can show empathy, right? Yeah. Like I don't have to get frustrated and mad and I'm disappointed because my expectation mm-hmm. of the morning, all those things, right. Right? I can stop and sit with him in that. And mm-hmm. we can, we can, we can come up with plan B and what we need to do to have a good morning. Um, but it is pausing. It is, it's, yeah. it's investigating. Yeah. I love how you just said come up with plan B because that's exactly what we did. Mm-hmm. We, then we got to have a little science lesson about why the water was cold. Mm-hmm. And then we looked at the weather and we plotted out the next warm day, which was like a day and a half after that. And we looked at how warm it was going to be. And we talked about all kinds of things. And then we landed on a plan to go back to the river, mm-hmm. like in the afternoon on Wednesday. And yeah. and. It, said to him, most likely it's going to be warmer. And then he like exhaled, was like, oh, he level set his expectations. And guess what happened on Wednesday? We went back in the afternoon and the sun was out and it was warmer. 
and we played in the river all day Wednesday, and we played in the river all day Thursday. Yeah. But we had to, mom, as mom and dad, as parent in that moment, we had so many teeny tiny microsecond decisions that we had to make about how we were going to, how we were going to provide safety and a sense of being known and cared for and cherished and validated Mm -hmm. to our kid in that moment who from the outside might have looked like he was misbehaving. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the behavior immediately stopped. It was like, oh, Hey, mom and dad are they're collaborative. I mean, we would say like problem, like collaborative problem solving. They're coming up with yeah. a plan, but he's just feeling it as, oh, I'm not in trouble. I can be disappointed if I need to be. My disappointment's reasonable. My parents have gone to my left brain, thinking logic brain, which is he loves his logic brain. We've explained it in a logical manner, and we've come up with a plan, and then we followed through. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, I mean, that is a teeny tiny little micro example. But this, we know as parents, this kind of stuff happens in a split second dozens of times a day yeah. with our kids. And it's about reframing how we see behavior. Yeah. Well, it's about learning to go, what? Oh, goodness, we were okay two seconds ago. We are no longer okay. What are the facts? Actors at play. Yeah. And then practicing the pause. JD, were you going to say something? Well, yeah. I, I just, you know, all of us as people are that way. Like all of us have a thousand different factors that contribute to how we feel, how we're acting, how we're responding in an individual moment. And as adults, we tend to be able to think, uh, you know, someone, whether it's a kid or, or spouse, partner, whatever, might say, you are so grumpy. Like, this is a a real today example. Like, why are you so, yeah, dad, why are you so grumpy? (laughs) And I can go, well, I was up, you know, till about one dealing with fleas we have in our house right now, which is just awesome. And then uh, was woken up at four by a toddler and then didn't go back to bed till about six, then got back up at 645. And then it's the first day back at school. So we're off the, and, and I just, I feel like, oh, I feel like I didn't sleep very much at all last night. I haven't had any coffee or anything to eat yet. or any- So I can self-diagnose that now and go, here's the factors that contribute to me feeling like myself. And because we've made space for this as a family now, that, you know, to use this as an example for myself, you know, my wife can go, okay, I got that. Instead of being like, why are you so grumpy? We just had this long vacation. You can never be happy. I tell you what, like we, we come back and you're all of a sudden mad. Like she would never do that because we've, we've kind of, we've, we've learned together to think about the why behind our own behavior. And so it helps also to, to do that and then to be able to diagnose. I mean, you guys were talking about with, you know, with an older kid who, who can, when you get to the point, access left brain and really talk through logically what's going on. I think one of the things that's ultra helpful for toddler parents is to do, is to practice this. I mean, I, we, we're in a fun toddler phase. We've got, you know, we, we've had some phases before with other kids that were, um, you know, we would call them, they, they're throwing fits or whatever. Or uh, when we were first parenting, it was like, I don't understand why they're spazzing out all the time. And then now we kind of know to, to look behind that. So we had a moment where, um, you know, toddler gets really angry and throwing stuff all over the place and, um, and messing up the game the big kids are playing. And it would have been really easy to say at the moment, like, what is wrong with you? And spank and, you know, pull it aside and say, like, the, the way that I was brought up would be to do this. Like, pull them aside and shame them. For like, you, you cannot mess up somebody else's game and you don't disrespect somebody's house by throwing stuff all around. Instead... Like I could start to recognize, oh, this is this is like hungry, thirsty behavior. Like I bet she's really hungry, thirsty. And I start thinking back, you know what? She got up. I don't think any of us gave her breakfast yet. <laughs> she's been up for hours now. So we stop and I say, hey, would you like something to drink? You want some ice water? Went and got some ice water. Went and got like a little granola bar or something, you know, whatever it was. And I mean, within minutes, totally back to equal again, totally back to rational place. Then we go back to say, hey, when we need something, just come use your words and ask for it. Don't throw stuff around. Let's go back and pick up this stuff that we messed up. And when you go make it right with the big kids and tell them you're sorry for, for breaking their game apart. So we're still addressing the actual behavior, but we've then taught how to replace, like how to get that need met when that feeling comes in and identifying that feeling with a need instead of that feeling with, you know, bad behavior that got punished. But you're teaching mm-hmm. the kid also eventually to help self-diagnose. 
It's really good. That's really good. I mean, we we talk we we talk about often just uh, how can we both inside and outside of the moment work with our kiddos, right? And so you had you had both of those in that situation, like yeah, yeah, in the moment. Um, and I mean, I just think you know, like you were talking about how you were raised. Um, what a shift it is, yeah, right. Oh, to yeah. and and a gift because how often are we, you know, just that punitive parenting? Yeah. Of and I know there's this balance, right? There's a balance of nurture and structure, and we mm-hmm. talk about that. Like there, we're not saying no structure, yeah, but we're saying how much, how many times has like so much structure used or punitive, you know, used on a child when. They haven't eaten, right? Yeah. Are they, yeah. you know, I mean, you just talked about you not getting enough sleep. Like, yeah. we know when kids don't get, like, we can't expect them to to do well when they don't get a, a lot right. of sleep or, you know, all of those things. And so, um, yeah, I mean, you just you just went through a couple of skills of, one, navigating and finding it then, of, of catching it uh, while it was happening. And then outside the moment, Man, you do want them to be able to regulate themselves. You don't. You yeah. don't want her throwing stuff every single time. So, how do right. we teach a skill? And and yeah, man, just use your words. Use yeah. your words and tell us. You don't. You know. Yeah. Um, well, I think so. We've, we've we've talked through kind of offline and, and in the the ATC parent trainer class. We we talk about you know a lot a whole list of different. Um, possibilities. Like, why is this happening? Well, maybe, you know, maybe they don't feel safe or maybe they need us to help co-regulate. Maybe they're flooded with emotions or they're overstimulated by the sensory environment. Like, I think the, you know, part of this is, uh, you know, you might be tuning in hoping that, you know, we're going to give you the five steps to chase the why and you use that grid every time and you ask the same questions every time. And the the unfortunate side of parenting is that uh, very rarely are, are, situations the same where the same tool works every time in the same way. But what you start to learn in in this practice over time is for each individual kid, you start to learn the different factors that factor into or contribute to adverse behavior of some type, you know, way, shape, or form. And so um, it, it doesn't, and I think, Tana, one thing you mentioned before we start recording that I think we do need to walk through is that um, this doesn't mean that every single behavior is always this deep, dark cry for a met need. Um, there are sometimes like just behaviors that are bad, <laughs> just need to be corrected, right? <laughs> and so uh, there are sometimes those things that need to happen. And so I think what, what it helps us to do is to just, at least for me personally, it's helped me to take the long view parenting. So I'm, I'm thinking throughout the day about the whole kind of diet of needs uh, that's there and how can I kind of structure our day or, or give some shape to our day to where the we're providing the best conditions for our kids to work through the day, you know? Yeah, so when we think about, kind of it goes back to that, like the belief that we said, if you fall into the trap that you believe all behavior is willful, then you have exactly one available response to you as a parent, and that is to punish it. Right. If you think they did it on purpose, then you go towards punitive consequences. If you can practice the pause, which does take practice, if you can start reframing behavior as communication, which again takes so very much practice, um, and you get curious then what begins to happen over time, so be patient with yourself, so much grace-filled patience here, that you will start to become, you know, the master of your child. Not the master, that's the wrong word, the student, the student of your child. And you'll understand what they are communicating and how they're communicating it and why they're communicating it. And then I promise you, the need for punitive consequences just drastically falls down because you're no longer in this battle of wills. You do this or this. It's, hey, love, I see that you're doing this. 
I wonder why you're doing this. What do we need to do to help you so that you can grow either in the moment or in the long game to where this behavior is not your default behavior when you come upon this obstacle or this problem or this emotion? We want our kids, JD, you hinted at it, and I think Modi, you did too. We want our children to have the ability to regulate themselves as adults. Yes. Yeah. And they need us to co-regulate with them when they're young and sometimes even into their teens and tweens and young adulthood. They need that external safe adult that can come in in a moment when they're struggling and their behavior is communicating something. And we can say, I'm here I see you, you're safe, I've got you, let's explore together what's going on. Yeah. Because we want them, when we're not around, and they feel that thing roll up in them that might be the precursor to the behavior. So let's just maybe give an example. If you've got a kid that might have a propensity to lie, like, you know, something just comes out and it's a quick lie, and... You know, those lie, a a child that has a tendency to lie can be incredibly perplexing and it can break down a relationship pretty quickly as a parent. So again, maybe that's a whole episode, but what we want ultimately as, as an, our child, as they grow into an adult is we want them to have the skills to say, I wonder what my triggers are that happen inside of me before I lie. Yep. And if they don't, or, or what stress factors are happening around me that make me lie? How do I view myself that makes me feel like I need to be, you know, lying? Is it a fear response? Is it a survival technique? Is it a, you know, a shame trigger? Like, when do I lie and why do I do so? And the, I just feel like the very best people to go on that journey with that particular human being are their parents. Yeah. And so if mom and dad punish lying, end of story, that's it, then the child is given no opportunity to explore why they lie. Yeah. Yeah. And then they can't grow in that skill of truth-telling. So again, I'm going to circle back to behavior is communication. Maybe it's telling you they have a need in the moment. JD, we you hinted what they need to eat or drink. That is a simple need we can meet. Please do not punish your baby because you set them up to fail. Because you not you, JD, but us general <laughs> parenting, because you didn't give them anything to eat except two donuts. And right. it's Saturday morning at noon and they're falling apart. Yeah. Give the baby yeah. some protein, rub their back, hug their neck. Carry on with your day. I promise you they'll be better in a minute. They need protein. Right. But don't punish them for that. Right. When they are old enough to start processing their own truth of why they do the things they do, we need to have built a foundation of trust with them so that mom and dad can hold my behavior even when it is inappropriate or it is bad, you know, like, yeah. or I'm doing something I should not be doing, then you know, we, we want to have that trusting, safe relationship where we can yeah. explore the why with them. And so if, if y'all can Google it, you can go to our show notes, we'll post it, but there are tons of like, they're called behavior icebergs out on the wonderful World Wide Web. And you can Google behavior iceberg and it will show you a picture. And if you can imagine it, it looks like an iceberg where you see the top of the iceberg and that's the behavior. And what we know to be true of icebergs is there is so very much going on underneath. Right. And that is the why. It could be social, emotional. It could be fear. It could be emotion. It could be relationship. It could be shame. It could be trauma. It could be, I mean, it can be so many, 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 many things that as a parent, we don't always know why, but we can always offer ourselves. Yeah. We can always practice the pause and come with empathy and curiosity. And then when we don't, we just repair the rupture because we won't always do that, but we can circle back around and say, hey, sweetie or honey or bud, I am so sorry that you were struggling and I was frustrated 
And can you forgive me? Let's figure out what's going on and how we can work on this together. I mean, we have to repair that rupture all the time. Well, and um, thinking yeah. about, you know, you know we, we talked about falling into the trap of, of only punishing behavior instead of supporting growth. And I think uh, if we were to look at this like a medical lens of like a chronic medical need that began popping up, after a certain amount of time, a, a doctor is going to go, Hey, we need to figure out why these headaches keep coming back, right? What what's the need? But what what's actually going on behind the headaches? Is, is there something else that could be causing these things? And so I think as parents, if if we can think about it as um, in some ways as cold and detached as possible, <laughs> like what helped me immensely was just the thought I can I can keep repeating in my head: Don't take this personally. Don't take this personally. There's something else going on. I am such a feeler and so kind of relational by nature that, you know, of course, any adverse behavior is an assault on my character or my relational ability as a parent. And if I keep, if I keep sort of a medical view and go, all right, this, this thing's, like you mentioned lying, like this thing's happening a lot. Why is this happening? Let's get to the bottom of this. It is then going to do the same thing that medical treatment would do. It alleviates those, uh, maybe not immediately, but over time alleviates those symptoms and allows the place that is that is causing those symptoms to emerge from to heal. And then uh, more than that, the next time those symptoms are to appear, this, the kid then knows, I bet this is this going on. And that self-regulation piece is a little bit stronger than it was last time that this happened. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think that is I think that is enormous. So, uh, well, I, I mean, I think that's that w- that's something that has has been um, monumental for me as well. I mean, so much of my parenting, I was taking things personal. Yeah. And what I need to realize in that moment is that my kiddo is not giving me a hard time. They are having a hard time, you know, and that is that is totally different. And and I I just felt like um, that yeah, it was an assault on me because yeah. they were angry or mad, yeah. right? <laughs> and and at that point, you really can't engage them. Like you have mm-hmm. you have right. you have you're in a bad spot. And yeah. and it is amazing to just be in that place where you're not taking it um, and uh, how you can calmly step in and help your child and support your child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, J.D., you said something earlier that I think maybe I didn't even answer because I went on a little rabbit trail or two. But when you talked about like is all behavior, um, you know, can they control all their behavior and that some behavior, you know, just needs to be addressed. Right. So, you know, before we sort of hop off, I do think it's important to say a couple things. We do believe that if behavior is inappropriate, that it needs to be addressed, you know, so yeah. we're not about sort of free for all parenting. Um, we do very much believe in a balance of nurture and structure in the world of good connected parenting. I mean, there are, you know, there is the ability to do some consequencing. Again, I think that's got, it can be very minimal. Um, I, I think especially for kids who've experienced a good bit of trauma, consequences, and rewards, like that um, corollary kind of parenting doesn't really typically work for them. In fact, I don't know that it really ever does. But but I, I think what's good for us to think about, and if you want to explore this more, I would definitely recommend reading The Whole Brain Child by uh, Dan Siegel and Tina Payne Bryson. Yeah. Or you can probably even Google this on YouTube. They do talk about an upstairs and a downstairs tantrum. And how oh, yeah, that's, um, our so kids funny. can use their logic brain sometimes. You know, you, we think, oh my goodness, our kids are manipulating us. Maybe y'all have seen this video. I don't know if any of y'all have, but it's so funny. It came out years ago. And it's about a little kid that is like laying on the floor pitching a fit and their parent walks out of the room and the kid gets up. They stop crying. They get up, they walk. They go to the room where the parent is. They see their parent. They fall down and start crying again. <laughs> the parent leaves and walks into another room. The child stands up finds a parent, lays down, falls down, and starts crying again. Okay, that's a child that is in their upstairs logic brain. They have full control over their behavior. Now, I still would go an extra layer and say, why does baby feel like they need to cry to get parents' attention? Right. So I do actually still think there's an opportunity (laughs) for growth. Okay, I'm always going to think there's something we could be thinking about that's beyond (laughs) just the consequence. But that is an upstairs tantrum. That is the kid is 
very in control of their emotion, very in control of their behavior. I think being absolutely adorable, how precious is that kiddo doing that? I would sort of probably laugh inappropriately and squeeze them and tell them they're amazing because how smart they are to, to try to utilize their upstairs brain that way. Again, not helpful. But here's my, um, my, maybe my closing thought would be, please don't fall into that trap first. Yeah. Please, yeah. as we are parenting our kids, because that's what we want to do. Mm-hmm. The easy thing is to say they can control it. They're opting not to control it. Therefore, consequence. Mm-hmm. The more helpful thing to them and to you, the thing that will build trust the thing that will build relationship, the thing that will build resiliency, the thing that will build the ability to self-regulate, the thing that will build that will build empathy and apathy and self-awareness, not apathy, empathy and self-awareness is the parent that goes on the wondering why, the parent that walks with them to chase their why mm-hmm. and then helps them grow, mm-hmm. doesn't just punish them. Mm-hmm. So yeah. we want to chase the why to empower our children to understand their why. Yeah, yeah. Which the beauty of that is we, we help them understand who they are, but we also in that process begin to understand who we are, yes. right? Yeah. And so yeah. this is growing together as, yeah. and, and there's great beauty, great beauty in that. Well, again, great stuff from Elantana, and um, hopefully you are leaving out of this episode with some tangible, real, just uh, take-home principles that that can actually uh, help you today. So uh, for Mo and Tana, for everybody at ETC, for Kyle Wright, who edits and engineers all of our audio, for Tad Jewett, the creator of the music behind the ETC podcast, and everybody else here at Empowered to Connect, we will see you next week on the Empowered to Connect podcast. Mm-hmm.